Hello, good morning everybody and thanks for joining me again in this seminar. Uh, last time there were so many questions that I didn't really have opportunity to deal with them all and um, it's the same today, more have come in. So I'm going to do my best to try and answer as many as possible. But um, just a very brief recap for those who are joining for the first time. Um, I, as you know, spent almost five years in solitary confinement in uh, rather austere circumstances without books or papers or companionship for almost five years. And uh, I had to learn how to, to manage that. It was an extreme situation, of course. And I made the point last time that it is from extreme situations that it's possible for there to be taken learnings that might be appropriate to so-called normal life or life as we live it now. Um, not that anybody would or very few people will have to go through the extreme situation that I and many others have passed through. And uh, so I spoke a little bit about my own experience and then went to the questions. Um, so uh, let, let me just start with the, f the first question that's come in. Uh, in the last webinar, you seem very neutral about your captors. What if any emotion did you have? Did you have and, and how have these feelings changed? And what have you learned about the nature of forgiveness? That came from uh, Christy in St Hilda's CV school and Donna in um, Bluecoats school. Well, I wonder if I might begin in rather an unusual way and um, read you a, a poem that I've written in a book called Out of the Silence, a collection of poetry that all was written after the experience and uh, some of it uh, put together in my head during those years. This is called Footsteps in the Corridor. They came at night, footsteps in the corridor, a key turning as fear grips my stomach. I lie still on the floor, blindfolded, sheltering beneath my thin blanket, seeking protection, seeking what scrap of security I may find. Sit, the command echoes round the cell like a shot from a pistol. Chains tug at my limbs as I struggle to obey. My wrists and feet are seized as locks are removed. Stand, I cannot. I stumble to my feet. What is happening? Why at this hour do they come? Can this be release? Do I stand on the brink of freedom? My arms are gripped as we move out of the cell into the unknown. There are many in the room. I hear laughter, words uttered in a half whisper, words I cannot understand. Sit, I crouch and sit. Sleep, I lie on my back. The room falls silent. What you say? What you say? Now I understand, another interrogation, another bout of questioning, another seeking for answers I cannot give. What you say? The voice is louder, insistent. Nothing, I reply, nothing. Something lands on my face, a pillow perhaps. I struggle to breathe as the pillow is held down. What you say? Someone holds my legs. Now my fear increases, the room falls silent. Suddenly a searing pain convulses my body. My feet are burning as blow after blow is struck with cable. What you say, what you say? I cry into the cover, oh God, let this pain cease. What manner of person can so treat another human being to such indignity and pain? Stand, I cannot. Arms lift me to my feet and drag me back into chains, back into the night back into a living death. And then I commented afterwards in the book, when I was dragged back into my cell and the shackles were replaced around my hands and my feet, I lay for a while in shock. 
I felt an overwhelming sense of pity for the one who had administered the beating. How could he bring himself to treat another human being in such a way? How could torturers the world over bring themselves to engage in such degrading practices? Thank God for Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch for their constant vigilance and protestation against inhuman treatment, no matter where it might occur or by whom it was administered. And then just one final verse. It's come out pain. The pain sears my soul, penetrates to the very depth of my being. At night alone I weep the tears of anguish, of loss, of despair. Take heart. Through pain you have entered a new realm. You have joined the community of compassion. Your sorrow will be turned to joy. Your tears will become laughter. Your wound will remain. But now through suffering, you have a new depth of soul. Well, that is in part in relation to the question about my being, my relationship with my captors. Uh, the captors, I suppose, were different categories, really. Every terrorist organization and every gang and every group attracts to it people who might just be like described as being psychopaths who have little or no feeling for the feelings of other people. But um, not all uh, members of those groups are, are psychopathic. Um, and yet they're drawn into these organizations. I, I give you an example. Um, when uh, John and Brian um, were together, John McCarthy and Brian Keenan in captivity, the food became very poor, very bad. And they complained about it. And nothing, nothing was done for a long, long time. And when eventually uh, the headman came to see them, he looked into it and he discovered the old trick, you know, the guard on duty had um, been given money to buy food. He'd pocketed half the money and then spent the other half on food. Consequently, the food was bad. And so they took this lad, the guard, took him outside and they shot him because they said, if you'll cheat us in small matters like that, Someone comes along with a big bribe and um, you'll give the whole game away. The point being there, that once these youngsters are in that sort of a gang, in that sort of a group, drawn into it for whatever reason, there's very little escape for them, even if they want to come out. And one of the ways of looking at this is to, is to recognize that many of these young people who, who, in those days anyway, and it's still true to a certain extent today, join those groups, they have not necessarily been always economically deprived, but they've often been at the bottom of the pile, you know, politically, uh, socially, despised, pushed to one side, result of broken homes or what, what have you. And they join the group and the, for the first time, they seem to have a sense of belonging, a sense of identity. Um, and <laughs> they somehow gain a, a greater respect for themselves. Um, but once they're in, as I say, they're in. And so I think the answer to, to the question really is this. Um, if you can understand, if I could understand the background from where, where these youngsters had come from and why they were behaving, the reasons for that, then that was not difficult to move towards understanding and forgiveness. Not at all difficult. Um, because one could have uh, an understanding of, of how they were operating and where they, where they came from. And I think that's true in, in most situations when it comes to forgiveness, that if you can understand, you can forgive. It doesn't mean to say for one moment that you condone the behavior. Of course you don't. Um, uh, and one should not condone bad behavior of any kind, of course not. So 
that's that question. Um, the isolation is not isolation in the sense that we're all virtually talking about isolation today. It's not isolation in the sense that we're all virtually connected. In, in my case, working from home. So a different work-life balance is to be established and increasingly uh, more virtual stimuli popping up. Any comments? That's from Claire. Uh, and another one, how did you keep, put these together, how did you keep track of time and the days? How do you motivate yourself? Well, um, just taking the second one first there, as you know, as I've said before, I was often in the dark and um, no, no clock or means of telling the time. And the only, it's very, very disorientating when you're in a situation like that, because you don't know whether it's day or night and you just don't know um, where you are. You can easily lose your sense of, of balance and direction. Um, and I was able to tell the time eventually when I was put um, in a place which was adjacent to a mosque. And of course there you have the call to prayer morning, noon and night, and that gave me a structure for the day. And I think that's the important point about this, that we all need to have a structure for the day. Um, when working from home, uh, it's so easy to um, just let things drift. But I think it's rather important to have some, some structure, so much time for this, so much time for that. That's what I used to do in captivity. I found that if I didn't have a structure, then it was, it was like living in a wilderness. And so I, I put so much time aside to, to think and to write in my head, which I did. So much time for what limited exercise I could do on the end of a chain and so on. And here in isolation today, I've been in isolation now for the past um, several weeks, like many of you watching, I think. and. Um, I have sort of built a structure for the day and now it becomes a natural, natural uh, process, natural part of it. Um, which feeling was more difficult to overcome to cope with? The physical pain, such as thirst, hunger or mental, such as mock execution, fear and anxiety. Is there anything you can particularly remember that helped you to readjust normal life? That's another question, sorry. Feeling was more difficult to overcome. Uh, really, that's from uh, Maria in Ashland School. Well, I was afraid, obviously, and, and I think that uh, poem I read to you um, indicates that. Um, I don't think, I was never really, uh, Maria, I was never really never really really hungry or thirsty i mean they always have gave me water and i got very simple not very good but very simple food i think yes i think the, the biggest fear was the mock execution and that that type of fear i mean i remember once they came into the room and the chap came in with an electric drill and i thought oh my god he's not going to use that on me you see and um Mercifully, all he was doing was uh, drilling um, holes in the wall so they could fit more staples to attach my chains to those um, to the wall. Um, so I was, I had to live constantly, really, on edge. And somehow uh, you learn to cope with it. I, I really, honestly, I really don't know, looking back on how I did cope with it, just somehow not letting myself be give way completely to fear and just holding on um, day in and, and day out. We will presumably have high numbers of staff and pupils with traumatic stress for various reasons, financial bereavement, domestic violence. What would be the best way to move forward as schools uh, ensuring everyone is supported? Well, that's an interesting question because um, I'll answer it in a couple of ways. I don't know if you remember, but a few years ago, 
there was a very uh, bad um, terrorist act in Kenya in a shopping mall and a number of children, uh, parents and teachers happened to be there. It was a shopping day from the same school and uh, a number were killed. And of course, this had quite a, a traumatic effect on the school. And I got a call from Kenya, from the, from the school itself, saying, was there any possibility of my going out and working with them uh, for a couple of days just to help them come to terms with this experience? So I, I flew out to, to, to Kenya and I, I previously worked in Africa. I knew Uganda and I knew Kenya a little bit. I didn't know the school. It was new to me. And um, uh, one of the things we did was to bring together uh, parents uh, and teachers and pupils and to enable them to uh, speak together, to talk together, just to share the experience together and to look at it in different ways. And um, it was really the whole process, just enabling people to quickly uh, talk about the experience and quickly um, get it out of the system, if you like. It, it did work. Um, we, I, I, can't, I won't go into all the details of how we structured it now, but it did work. And there was a, another, uh, I built that on a, another experience I had some time previously when working with colleagues in Kosovo. And in Kosovo, following, following any warfare, but this was true in Kosovo, but following any warfare, you have um, people go away and forget about the situation, leaving behind the casualties. And the casualties are mainly women and children who are traumatized by some of the dreadful things that have happened. I remember meeting one young boy who um, was in his house with his parents. Uh, soldiers came in, they shot every member of the family, excepting this boy who hid under a table or somewhere. And when he came through this experience, when he came out, when he, he, he couldn't speak, he was just totally traumatized by the whole experience. And he was just one of, of many kids and, and uh, m mothers who'd been really badly affected by, by the war. So we, we set up a whole series of clinics across the country. We brought uh, young w women mainly to this country for uh, special training. And then they went back and, uh, and started the clinics. One of the techniques they used was this. The problem was getting the youngsters to talk about the experience. And so they were given um, sheets of paper and crayons in one room, the mother's room in another room. And they uh, just asked, draw, draw what you wish. And they drew, and invariably, they drew uh, pictures which um, were coming from their deeper inner feelings. And then we brought them two together and said, right, just tell your, your mother about these, uh, these pictures. Just talk to her. And that began to open up the dialogue between the mother and the child in a way that enabled them to get rid of the, the negative experiences. I mean, I think the general theory is, which you know as well as I do, that if you have had a traumatic experience and you push it down, um, you, it invariably will reappear at a later stage in dreams and nightmares and flashbacks. But somehow, if you can begin to deal with it fairly soon, after the, the experience and uh, manage it, then um, you can, to a degree, manage it rather than be managed by it. And that, that's the point. Um, so I think it is a question of, of understanding and talking and enabling youngsters and, and others to really get it out of their system and come to terms with it. And sometimes that needs professional help. I, I, I admit that, but not always. What is the best way of coping on a day-to-day -day basis? Did you allow yourself to look to the future? And how 
uh, this may change your life in the future. Well, um, I already partly touched it. Um, Day-to-day -day basis. It was just going back to what I said about the. Oh, that that who did that come from? By the way, that came from Joe in St Nicholas Primary. Um, building the structure, and, and keeping my mind alive, and that is the the absolutely vital thing to do, and it's a vital thing to do today. I think um, to keep your brain active. I take this opportunity, this time of um, being away from normal activity, as a real opportunity. Uh, in fact, I, I'm fortunate I don't have the worries that many people have about um, loss of uh, em employment or um, financial worries for the future because I don't have any income coming in or, and, and mercifully so far, I don't have anyone close to me who is... Um, desperately ill. That, I'm very fortunate, I realise, there are many people for whom this is a time of acute anxiety and have great sympathy for that. But nevertheless, it still is a time when, for me, I can just say, right, take this as a creative period in your life and use it to um, explore some of the things you probably haven't had time to explore before. Try and learn something new each day, which I'm doing. Um, I rarely, <laughs> one of those people who rarely switch on the TV, but uh, I've been looking at uh, Catch Up, you know, and some of the old programs. I saw a, a terrific production the other night of um, uh, King Lear, Shakespeare, um, set in, in a contemporary way. Really, really brilliant pr production. And uh, I've been catching up. I'm, I'm not a, really a film goer, but I've been catching up on a number of old films. I've been reading books and I've been um, trying, to, trying to keep my mind going and trying to learn something new each day, not just fall into a rut. And I, I've actually found it really <laughs> very enjoyable. And also, of course, I'm immensely fortunate with having the social media and being able to communicate with people and with yourselves and, and with, with others in the in the way that we we do. Did you allow yourself to look into the future? And how mis, how did this may change your life in the future? Um, that, that's uh, part of the same question. Um, yeah, I I I I did to a degree, but. Not very much, um, because I just not a clue, really, to be honest, whether I was going to ever get out of that situation. And uh, as I've said repeatedly, you know, what I had to do was learn to live for the day, live for the moment. Um, but it has changed. It has changed my, my, my um, way of life, unquestionably. But I think, you know, in life, we should be changing and developing all the time. But it did change it in a rather radical way for me. <clears throat> when I came out of captivity, my uh, job had been left open for me. And uh, all my life, uh, I'd been fortunate because I had a salary job. But when I came out, I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take that up again. Um, I'm going to really give my life to trying to follow some of the things that I believe I ought to follow more fully. That is working with the homeless, working with hostages and families, hostage families, and working with young people overseas who don't have many opportunities and trying to give them some opportunities to, to build a decent life. So I'm going to give myself to those three areas of work and uh, I'm not going to take any any salary from those charities, which is MS for the homeless, YCARE, which I helped found for young people, and Hostage International, which again I helped found. I'm not going to take any money from them. I'm going to try to earn my own living by writing and lecturing. And that's what I I did. Now, without the experience of captivity. 
I honestly doubt whether I'd have had the sufficient courage uh, to launch out in that way because I've been so accustomed to having a salary job. And so um, some, yeah, that experience of, of having absolutely nothing really did give me the stimulus, if you like, to say, come on, you can get up, you can, get up, you can do it. The other thing about a, 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 a period of, of isolation through which we're passing at the moment, very often you work through it and you begin to discover that you have within yourself gifts and abilities that you never knew you had. I never knew that I'd have the ability to, to write. Um, and that's for writing poetry, to be perfectly honest. I've never been a, a great fan of poetry. And, and a lot of it, I, I just still can't read. I find it impossible. But um, if you'd have told me a few years ago, you'll write and publish a book of, of poetry and reflections, I would have given you a very hard look. But you never know. You see, you never know what gifts and abilities you have. <laughs> Some will say, well, they're not very evident because it's not brilliant poetry. Or well, maybe, maybe, who knows? Anyway, how did your faith play a critical part in your time in isolation? What advice would you give to people who are exploring their faith while in isolation and lockdown? Um, that comes from uh, Teresa in uh, National CV Junior School. Well, it's a big question, isn't it? I have never believed that if you have faith, then you're given special protection. Um, I believe that faith enables you to face what may, it gives you resources to face it, the, the ups and downs of life, but you don't get special protection. Um, in captivity, I, I did find it important, as I said, to have a structure. And I found that I was grateful for the fact that I'd been brought up as a chorister, brought up with the good language of the Book of Common Prayer and the structures of the church services, which I had unconsciously remembered from childhood. And so each morning <clears throat> I would recite to myself the communion service um, because I remembered it in my head. I'd save a little bread and, and uh, take communion service myself. This was just a way of giving some, some structure, some order, um, and holding things together. And in my imagination, as I said that service, I linked myself in my imagination with um, others around the world who were saying the same service and going through the same service as myself here in isolation, um, miles from anywhere. And um, I've never believed either that faith is dependent on feeling, because feeling is so uh, subject to so many factors. You know, you could be ill and that can affect your feeling. And I don't think you should base faith on feeling at all. Um, but I, I didn't lose faith. And faith enabled me more than anything else to maintain hope. So I would say, it's coming up to the end, it's half past, can I get one more question in? Um, oh, that I've just answered it. Did you, during your terrible ordeal, did you ever have reason to question your faith? Said um, Ash from um, Burlish Park Primary. Um, no, not, not to question it. But on the other hand, you know, I've always had questions. I've always, um, I think, because you have faith, doesn't mean to say you shouldn't question and you don't have doubts. Yes, I've always had questions, I've always had doubts. And I've always regarded faith as being an exploration, a, a movement towards an understanding of the mystery that lies within and the mystery that lies beyond. We give, um, you know, we give shape to that mystery through our rituals, through our services, through our concepts. We give it a human shape because that's the way we can get hold of it. But in the actual fact, it really is a great mystery. 
the great mystery of life, the great mystery of death, the great mystery of purpose. And part of the understanding of faith is to grow more closely to that mystery which lies within and beyond. Um, after your last uh, web webinar, has it triggered any negative thoughts or emotions that affect you mentally? No, it hasn't, though. Um, I don't mind talking about it, um, talking about the experience. Um, how has your relationship with yourself changed as a result of your captivity? Um, well, it's, it's, it has, as that little poem put it, it has, in fact, deepened my compassion. Compassion for people who find life tough, who find life hard. And it's deepened my desire to be on their side and to try at least uh, to make my contribution to making this world, hopefully, a little better place for us all. So that's about it. I've got a whole pile of questions here I haven't answered. I'm sorry about that, so I can't get to it. But perhaps, you know, one day, when all this is past, if I have the opportunity to meet face to face, maybe in your school or maybe somewhere. Meanwhile, thanks for joining me. And um, apologies for not being able to deal with every question. Bye bye.